All right, we're gonna be taking questions from the audience as well as from our app, c2st2.cnf.io. You can type that in on your phone if you'd like to ask a question there. Uh, it was a wonderful discussion about, about the brain and the development, but I'm gonna ask you about the other uh, part of the uh, anatomy, the, the foot and the uh, calcaneus and whether there was an arch and is that, you know, are we really into a yeah. full human uh, foot yeah. at this point? So what you see in the skeleton of both Salams and Lucy's is by and large very, very human-like foot with both the transverse and longitudinal arch. What is, so that has never been questioned, and that's why I said we're not questioning whether afferensis was bipedal. And as you, as, as you would imagine, the foot would be first to go because that, that's the thing that is going to be used right away. What is interesting to us, however, is in order to answer the question whether there was climbing in this early species or not, it's a matter of identifying those characters that will indicate climbing or are ep like but then look at them during growth and what they, what they do. If indeed, like Salam, in spite of the arch which you mentioned, both longitudinal and transverse, in, in spite of the cuboid which is uh, as long as in humans, uh, in spite of many of the human like the calcaneus which is robust, in spite of the talus, which is flat, so the tibia can come and sit on it. All of them are human-like. But then you also have this mobile toe, which would be very handy if Salam was to climb trees or maybe hang on to her mom, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, to answer your question, yes, the rest of the many features, including the calcaneus, are human-like. We have an online question. How far apart were Lucy and Salam found? Does that tell you anything about the range of that species? Geographically, 10 miles, separated by a major river. Overall, the whole area where you have Salam, Lucy, and others is the same sedimentary basin. So it's only 10 miles apart. You, you mentioned that, um, you, you showed us the wide area over which you found all these bones, and am I to infer that you found one each of each of the bones that an individual should have, or, or how else did you know that they all came from the same individual? So how do we know the skeletons, which now constitute over 60% of the skeleton, whether they come from one individual or multiple individuals? That's a very good question, actually. So what we do is we look at three things. The first one is circumstantial evidence, where they were found, same site. Second, if you find three legs, clearly you're dealing with two individuals. <laughs> and, 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 and we have not. But number three, we also look at the degree of development. In the skeleton of Salams, they, the bones are not completely fused, which is consistent with her age at death. So circumstantial evidence location, that we don't have multiple of a single element, and then also we have the degree of development. Does it answer the question? Yes. Wow. Have you been able to look at the semicircular canals, and do you know if yes. she... Yes. Yeah, she... She is ahead of us now, yes, and I'll answer that question. So she's asking actually the ear, inner ear, uh, the labyrinth, the, the bony labyrinth, contains uh, your balancing system. And you have three semicircular canals that control your movement, and they happen to be very chimp-like, which is consistent with the notion that these guys were also climber, climbers. Right, we have an online question. What other big research questions can be answered by studying Salam? After she's aged precisely, what's next? Uh, the, see, if I was to be asked this, uh, the same question, let's say, in 2006, 
I would have said, yes, we will study the foot, we will study the scapula, we will study the vertebrae, but I would not have imagined the revolution that occurred in terms of imaging and the visualization using the synchrotron technology. So going forward, I think that technique is going to allow us to access many things, including what we call the trabecular bones. Now you can actually penetrate into the bones and examine bone density. And that understanding is gonna allow you to talk about how much of stress you had applied on that specific bone, which would be relevant to locomotion and many other uh, questions in paleoanthropology. I was curious about where dinosaur bones are found in relation to where human ancestor bones are found, because I know um, dinosaur bones are also found in Africa, but other places as well, and are, where you look, are they, do you find both, or are they in separate yeah. places, or how do you search okay. that? So uh, the main point would be the age of the rocks. So when you look at the history of life, uh, and then you quickly skim through, actually the field, is, field Museum really does a great job of the main events. See, we're talking here main events in human evolution, but if you were to look at the main events in life and its history, then you would start with something like fish type vertebrate animals, and then you will transition into some amphibian-like, tetrapod-like animals, like the one that was discovered by my colleague Neil Shubin, Titalic, and then you would go to reptiles and then mammals, and then within the reptiles, before 65 million years ago, you would have dinosaurs. And human ancestors, the types that I'm discussing, did not, were not, cannot be found actually in sediments that old. They emerge sometimes six to seven million years ago. So there is no possibility for dinosaurs and humans to be encountered at the same site unless there is some disturbance of mixing of the sediments. So they are found in many parts of the world. As you know, dinosaurs are all over. They're in Africa, in the US, and you name it. But when you speak of the human ancestry, especially those that are older than two million years are exclusively African as far as we have the knowledge today. So they're not, in, they, because they existed in two different times, they are separated by 60 million years, dinosaurs and humans. So you cannot possibly find them at the same site. Do we know what she ate? Uh, you, oh, yes. So, uh, actually, now we have techniques to determine uh, what an ancient uh, hominin species ate using what we call the stable isotope studies. And these are techniques, basically, you go into the enamel, again, you beg the curator to uh, let you take a sample of the enamel, and then you can look into what we call the carbon isotope. Some are gonna be rich in the heavy carbon, uh, which is 13, and some are gonna be rich in the light carbon. Based on that, I don't wanna go to the details, I don't wanna bore you with that, but based on that, you can determine if they were mostly eating leaves and fruits, i.e. tree-based diet, or they were based on, their, their diet was based mostly on grasses. You can tell that far based on, but mostly these guys were vegetarian, they were plant dependent. So the question is how much of their food was based on grass versus based on tree. It is true that I myself with my colleagues have published that Afrancis actually consumed meat, but that behavior would be very opportunistic and sporadic. By and large, these species were plant, uh, vegetarians. Do we have any idea what caused the area where you found her to change so dramatically? Yes, uh, so it really boils down to geotectonics. As I mentioned, 30 million years ago, Africa was an island. No 
uh, connections with Europe or other continents. Saudi Arabia, actually, the Arabian plate was still connected with the uh, African plate. By around 16 to 17 million years ago, you have the, uh, now we, th we, we take the ice sheet covered uh, both poles for granted, but before, at that point, we did not have the North Atlantic as sheets, it was not there. And then the Southern comes around that time. And as you have that condition, the, the, that pushed the tropical environment further north. And around 17 to 11 million years ago, Europe was like the hub of what we call the apes. They're not the African great apes who are closely related to us, but this extinct species, it was covered with apes. I'm talking about like Spain, France, and all those countries. And that is because the environmental change pushed the tropical zone northwards. All the primates moved, they don't care. They're just following, tracking their environment. And it's actually called the Miocene Climatic Optimum because the temperature was, uh, the, the climate was changing and they moved north. And by around 9.6 million years ago, you have the formation of the North Atlantic ice sheet and then they started pushing the tropical zone down and then they came to Africa and Asia also. So there is this movement of, uh, uh, not just primates by the way, those lar large mammals also, even rats are doing it. So it's all those dynamic geotectonic, i.e. geological, but also climatic conditions that are also caused by uh, the orbital precisions and other astronomical factors combined that are gonna have a long lasting environmental change. So it's a combination of many factors. But when we say the early hominins are African, it is because the common ancestor of the chimpanzees and humans six million years ago lived in Africa. Prior to that, Europe 16 million years ago is littered with all sorts of apes. What, uh, what geological features suggest a fruitful place to go searching for fossils? Uh, so the question is, what would be the good geological context for finding fossils, especially human fossils or, okay, human fossils? The first thing is the age of the rock should, in my view, should, be, should not be, maybe I shouldn't say this. That would be given, th this is how I should answer it, given the molecular evidence, which suggests that we separated from the chimp sometimes seven to eight million years, I think if we were to look at rocks that are older than 10 million years ago, it's interesting to understand our greater ape ancestry but it may not be fav uh, favorable for finding bipedal species. That's number one. The second one is it has to be, of course, sedimentary rocks. If it's igneous volcanic, uh, it's not gonna be good because it's in sedimentary rocks that the remains of the plants and the animals are going to be accumulating. But also, it's areas that preferably are not covered with vegetation, so you can go and look at them easily, like the pictures that I showed you. But it does not mean that there are maybe early humans buried somewhere in Europe, deep in the sediments, but un unless you have that ge geological tectonics bringing them out, you're not gonna know. And as you know in science, if we don't know, then we don't know. But the, to answer your question, the right age, rice sediments, and maybe not a lot of vegetation cover. Hi, I've Hi. got a question. It's kind of in three parts, but they all come together. One is, uh, um, is work at the site continuing? Are you looking for additional parts? Um, and I believe you said 60% of the skeleton has been recovered so far. Is there a part that you have not yet recovered that you personally would love to find yep. because it might explain something that interests yeah. you? That's a very good question. Yes, we do go to that site and other sites every year. 
As a matter of fact, even after the discovery of Salam, we've published uh, many other great discoveries, including the one that pertains to the early use of stone tools and uh, cut mark bones, suggesting that the species was involved in meat consumption 3.4 million years ago. I did go to the site where Salam was found for at least eight years nonstop. And it has almost become now a, like a pilgrimage, actually, to stop by even for a day or two to see if there is something exposed. And you ask the very pertinent question, that is, which bone would you like to find? That would be the pelvis, because that's missing. So we have everything above the, the pelvis. We have this part, the legs and the foot. This is missing. So I would love to find that. All right, unfortunately, we just have time for one last question. Hi, um, just out of curiosity, based on what you discovered, do you know her cause of death? Or is there any information? That, that, that's a good question. So the cause, cause of death, we do not have direct evidence as to what may have caused her death. But I can tell you, based on circumstantial evidence, the following. Number one, on the bones, you don't see any marks that suggest she was attacked by a predator or carnivore or scavenger, number one. Number two, you don't see that she was transported by the river over a long distance because it's basically the whole corpus has been preserved and deposited right away, number two. Number three, we found her in a, uh, in a geological, we call it depositional environment. The depositional environment is nothing but you can have fossils deposited as part of the channel, the main channel, or the levee, or the floodplain, or the swamp. There are all places they can, they are favorable for preserving bones. We found her in what is called deltaic. That's the river where the river discharges its contents to the lake, where the force is not too strong. So short of those evidences of carnivores and scavengers, Short of uh, the fact that she was not transported over long distance, otherwise she would have been completely fragmented. We think, we surmise, that maybe she drowned or some sudden flood took her away and then that may have caused her death. But again, if you're asking me as a scientist, my answer should be no, I don't know. But that would be my, uh, my hunch, if that, whatever that means to you. Does it answer your question? Okay. I, I saw one person raising their hand long, long time. Have to get out. No? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you have any more <laughs> questions, you can submit them to us, or and we you can, can send them to Dr. Olamsega. Thank you, everybody, for attending this evening. Yeah.